The Tuskegee Airmen were a group of African Americans who enlisted in the United States Army to become America's first black military airmen. This was during a time when many people felt that black men lacked the intelligence, courage, and skill for military service. And if this is the type of content that you enjoy, you can find more content like this at OneMikeHistory.com. Also, if you'd like to support the channel, you can do so at my Patreon page or my Buy Me Coffee in the description below. Also, please support the YouTube channel and give us five stars on Apple Podcasts. But without further ado, let's get started. It's important to properly dispose of unwanted medication or sharps. MedProject offers free and convenient disposal options near you. To learn more, call 844-MED-PROJECT or visit medproject.org. Prior to World War II, racial segregation was the rule for most of the country, and many in the military believed that black soldiers were simply inferior to whites and performed relatively poorly in combat and were completely incapable of flying airplanes. A 1925 study conducted by the Army War College concluded that African Americans were inherently ill-suited for combat physically and psychologically. So the United States continued their policy of segregating black and whites as well as limiting their roles within the military. In 1938, with Europe teetering on the brink of another great war, Congress passed Public Law 18, which authorized the training of military pilots for the Air Corps at civilian colleges and universities. It was referred to as the Civilian Pilot Training Program. See, the United States Air Force wasn't created until 1947, and prior to that, flying in the military meant that you were a part of the Army branch, which was called the United States Air Corps. During the beginning of this program, the military simply refused to offer the training program at black colleges. So a Howard University student lodged a lawsuit in protest, and thanks to the mounting pressure from black newspapers, the NAACP, and even Eleanor Roosevelt. In September of 1940, the Franklin Delano Roosevelt administration responded to this lobbying campaign by announcing that the AAC planned to establish an experimental training program for black pilots, and this led to the creation of the 99th Pursuit Squadron. For the training site, the War Department chose Tuskegee Army Airfield in Tuskegee, Alabama, which was then under construction. Many in the black community were stunned by the choice of Tuskegee, Alabama, giving the South's reputation of racial intolerance. Others felt like it was a fitting tribute to Booker T. Washington, who had built Tuskegee Institute from scratch in 1881 and served as an advisor for Theodore Roosevelt. The 99th would consist of 35 pilots and 300 Crown personnel, managed by white officers. Since it was an insult for white officers to be assigned to black troops, the War Department decided to use voluntary white non-commissioned officers to supervise, but they would be replaced by black officers as soon as the officers were qualified. In addition to a thousand pilots, the Tuskegee program trained over 14,000 navigators, bombardiers, instructors, aircraft and machine mechanics, patrol tower operators, and other maintenance and support staff. Those that possess the physical and mental qualifications to be accepted in the aviation cadet program would initially be trained as single engine pilots and would later then be trained on twin engine planes, navigators, and bombardiers. The cadets received 15 weeks of primary training. After the completion, the cadets would then move on to combat pilot training. Most of these cadets were either college graduates or undergrads that demonstrated academic qualifications for comprehensive entrance exams. No military standards were lowered for these pilots or any of the support personnel. The first aviation cadet class began in July 1941, and despite the official report stating that there would be 35 black pilot trainees, only 13 started the class. The cadets lived in dreadful conditions at Tuskegee Airfield while it was being completed. They stayed in tents, ate in a mess hall that was pretty much four walls with a dirt floor, and with what little free time they had, they couldn't go to downtown Tuskegee because of the hostility of the white townspeople and because it was strictly segregated. After nine months, in March of 1942, only five successfully completed the training program, one of them being Captain Benjamin O. Davis Jr., a West Point graduate. The other four were commissioned second lieutenant, and all five received the Army Air Corps' silver pilot wings. 
with America now at war, there was greater urgency to train personnel for combat. The 99th Fighter Squadron would have to wait for their opportunity to perform in combat, and many asked that they intended to be used at all. But in April 1st, 1943, the 99th got word they'd been called up. And the following morning, the men boarded a train for New York that then left for North Africa and later Sicily. 400 members of the 99th and 3,500 white servicemen all fell under the command of now Lieutenant Colonel Benjamin O. Davis. He was the first black officer to ever command white troops. Early on, the 99 flew sometimes as many as three to four missions a day. The average white pilot only flew 50 missions before being rotated out. The 99 flew as many as 70 plus missions before being relieved. The men of the 99 knew that they could not break under the intense pressure because they were under a magnifying glass. After the commander of the 99th assigned fighter squadron group, Harold R. Maddox, complained about the 99th performance, Benjamin Davis had to defend his vision before a War Department committee. This led to the 99th being moved to Italy, where they served alongside the 79th Fighter Group. Early in 1944, this was a turning point for the 99th, where they shot down 12 German planes in just two days. Later, in April of 1944, a study that covered the actions of the 99th during 1943 and early 1944 was completed, and the study read, an examination of the record of the 99th Fighter Squadron reveals no significant differences between this squadron and the balance of the P-40 squadrons in the Mediterranean theater of operations. The report recognized the 99th as a superior tactical fighter unit, and this report and the heroic efforts completely changed the military's view of the 99th and black airmen. Around this same time, early in 1944, the 100th, the 301, and the 302 fighter squadrons arrived in Italy. These black squadrons made up the newly formed all-black 332nd fighter group, led by promoted again Colonel Benjamin O. Davis Jr. As soon as the 99th was transferred to the 332nd fighter group, then the 332nd was then reassigned to the 15th Strategic Air Force in Ramatelli, Italy. The group then received new planes, P-37 Thunder Jets, to escort heavy bombers during raids of enemy territory. The 332nd painted the tails of their planes with red tails because they wanted bomber pilots to know who was escorting them when they looked out the window, earning them the enduring nickname Red Tails. Over the course of the war, the 332nd flew 15,000 combat sorties over 1,500 missions and sent 450 pilots into battle. The Tuskegee Airmen shot down 112 German aircraft, destroyed 950 ground units, and sank a destroyer using only machine gun fire alone. While none of the Tuskegee Airmen achieved A status, three airmen, Captain Edward Toppins, Captain Joseph Eisenberry, and First Lieutenant Lee Archer shot down four planes during their service in Europe. However, the most distinctive and controversial achievement of the Tuskegee Airmen was that no friendly bomber was lost to enemy aircraft during 2000 escort missions was most likely not true. In March of 1945, Chicago Defenders stated that no bomber escorted by the Tuskegee Airmen was lost to enemy fire. This statement was simply repeated and not challenged for years. Later, a detailed analysis was found that the 332nd lost at least 25 bombers over the course of the war. However, the report does credit the airmen with not losing a bomber to an escort mission over a six month period between September of 1944 and March 1945. Despite this, the airmen had a much better success rate than any other bomber escort group in the 15th Air Force, who lost on average 46 bombers during the exact same period. Even with all their successes, the Tuskegee officers found that when they returned from Europe, they were still second-class citizens at home. Their contributions to American freedoms had not endured them to their white military brothers. In March of 1945, the last of the Tuskegee group, the 477th Medium Bombardment Group, moved to Godman Field adjacent to Fort Knox to Freeman Field because of better facilities. Tensions between the 477th and the white command structure on the base were tense from the moment they arrived. Arrived. The commanding officer of the base, Colonel Robert Sigway, moved quickly to set up and enforce a segregated system. The 477 was housed in dilapidated buildings, and Colonel Segway also created a system to deny black airmen entry into the officer's club. He classified black airmen as trainees, even though they had all finished flight school. Therefore, they were commissioned officers. As trainees, they were forced to use a rundown, non-commissioned officer's club nicknamed 
Uncle Tom's Cabin. This occurred despite an order issued in 1940 by President Roosevelt himself that no officer should be denied entrance into the officers club. April 5th, 1945, a group of black officers peacefully entered the Freeman Field Officers Club in protest of direct orders to put them to stay out. 103 officers were arrested and charged with insubordination and faced court-martial. The court-martial proceedings were quickly dropped against all but one of the officers, a Lieutenant Roger Bill Terry, who was convicted for brushing up against a superior officer while trying to enter the club. 50 years later, in August of 1995, 15 of the original 103 officers who were arrested received official notification that their military records had been expunged of any reference to the Freeman Field incident and also Mr. Terry's court-martial conviction had been reversed and his military record cleaned. Even after the war in Europe, the Tuskegee Airmen returned home to the United States and faced continued racism, bigotry, despite their outstanding war record. Tuskegee Army Airfield continued to train new airmen until 1946, with women entering the program in several support fields. A large number of black airmen elected to remain in the service, but because of segregation, their assignments were limited to the 332nd Fighter Group or the 477th Composite Group. Opportunities for advancement and promotion were severely limited. Nonetheless, black airmen continued to perform superbly, and from 1941-1946, 996 pilots graduated from Tuskegee Army Airfield receiving commissions and pilot swings. In 1947, the newly formed U.S. Air Force initiated plans to integrate all its units. The Army was also on demand and needed qualified people but were unable to get experienced black personnel because of their segregation policy. In 1948, Harry Truman enacted Executive Order 9981, which directed equal treatment and opportunity for all in the United States Armed Forces. This order, in time, led to the end of racial segregation in the armed forces. This also was the first step towards racial integration in the United States. The Tuskegee Airmen performed outstandingly during World War II, and each airman accepted the challenge and proudly displayed their skill and determination while suppressing their eternal rage from the humiliation and indignation of frequent experiences with racism and bigotry. These airmen fought two wars, internally and externally, and still the positive experience for the United States military, the outstanding record of accomplishment, the superb behavior of the Tuskegee Airmen during World War II and after were major factors in the initiation of historic social change that worked to achieve racial equality in the United States. Thank you. This has been One Mike. I'm your host, Country Boy. If you like this, you can find more content that you can find more content like you can find more content like this at onemikehistory.com. Also, if you'd like to support the channel, you can do so on my Buy Me Coffee or my Patreon page in the on my, my my Buy Me Coffee or my Patreon page in the description below. Also, please subscribe to the YouTube channel and give us five stars on Apple Podcasts. Peace.